Hey there, my name is Salandrak, and here's my coverage of Terraria's Labor of Love update. I did a live stream when the update was released and have subsequently reviewed all the patch notes, watched a few videos, and spent some time playing the game. And in this video, I'll be reviewing what I feel are the most noteworthy changes this update brings to Terraria. So let's get to it! I've always felt like Terraria has an incredible amount of replayability with its various world gen settings, all the options of gear loadouts and playstyles, and multiple difficulty levels. When the 1.4 Journey's End update first came out, the devs further enhanced Terraria's replayability with several new special world seeds that mix things up even more. And so it comes as no surprise that the Labor of Love update brings with it some new seeds and tweaks some of the pre-existing ones. For the new seeds, there's now a No Traps seed created by putting that in the World Seed field, and contrary to what you might think, rather than having no traps, it has a ton of traps, including some particularly nasty new ones. So if you want a world that will definitely keep you on your toes while exploring, this one's for you. Another new seed that really mixes things up is the Remix seed created by putting Don't Dig Up in the seed field. This seed really alters world gen, and will have you start in a forested underworld, and from there you'll have to go up through the oddly placed lasagna of biomes to eventually reach the surface, an evil biome covered hellscape. And finally, the last new seed is the Everything Seed, also called the Zenith World, and is created by entering Get Fixed Boy as the World Seed. This seed is a combination of various features of all the other special world seeds in the game, and is definitely not for the faint of heart. Any bets on who will be the first player to defeat it with a hardcore character on the highest difficulty setting? The other world seeds got a few tweaks as well. Charlie from the Don't Starve crossover updates The Constant Seed got her damage significantly increased with a shorter delay before she attacks. The Celebration Seed will now be more fancy and festive than ever, and the For the Worthy seed has been adjusted to be even more challenging. If you haven't tried any of these seeds yet, I definitely recommend giving them a try, as they all really change up the way you play the game. The Labor of Love update adds a ton of awesome quality of life updates. There's too many to cover in one video, but here are, in my opinion, some of the best that you'll want to start taking advantage of or otherwise enjoy as soon as possible. For starters, the game now has equipment loadouts to let you instantly swap between three different sets of armor, accessories, vanity items, and dyes at the press of a button, and none of those items will take up any of your regular inventory space when not actively equipped as the loadout. Have two or three different class loadouts you'd like to switch between on the fly? Well, now you can. Or maybe keep a full set of fishing gear on one and a building or mining set on another for quick switches as the situation requires. Do note though that only items in your active loadout will be counted as equipped, so if you swap from a summoner set loadout to melee, you'll lose the extra minion capacity and will have to recast them when you switch back to summoner. Helping combat carpal tunnel syndrome since September 2022, there is now a settings option to auto-fire all the things. Just hit escape, then settings, and toggle the auto-fire selection to on, and everything will have auto fire and auto swing. I'm particularly a fan of this setting with yo yo's, as they will now automatically shoot back out with no need to re click when their spin duration runs out, and tons of weapons that I used to avoid because of all the clicking they required, such as early game bows and quick attack guns, are now back on the menu. Journey mode characters will also have less clicking to do as shift clicking an item into the research window will now automatically research the item. No clicking the research button required. There are quite a few changes that significantly enhance inventory management, and here's a few of them. The maximum stack size of nearly every stackable item has been increased to 9,999. No more filling your inventory with blocks of dirt, stone, and mud when making tunnels, and it will take a lot longer to fill up your storage chests now too. Speaking of storage chests, the quick stack to nearby chests function now visually shows the items flying to their respective chests, while the chests now will open up to gobble up the items, and the range has been greatly increased. You used to have to stand pretty close for the sorting to work, but now it goes up to a distance of about 36 tiles in all directions, so a pretty big area around your character. 
I've not yet figured out how the game prioritizes where to send things if there are multiple chests in range that already contain a given item, so if you know, please let me know down in the comments. Void Bags also got several additional features. A bag can now be closed by right-clicking it to prevent any overflow items from going in, making it basically like a second money trough or piggy bank. But any bag that isn't closed now has additional features that really make it an extension of your regular inventory. For example, you can now consume food items and potions from your void bag just by hitting the respective hotkeys. You can also craft items in the void bag without having it opened on screen, and items will automatically sort to nearby chests with the quick stack function. If you want something to stay put in the void bag, you can simply mark it as a favorite so it won't sort to nearby chests. Any informational utility items like a depth meter or watch will also work while placed in the void bag. Exploring the dungeon will now be a lot easier, as the quantity of cracked dungeon bricks has been reduced, and these bricks can now be broken by projectiles. The projectiles don't seem to do a great job of clearing out the bricks, though it does seem like chain reactions are more common, so there should be a lot less manual digging to open new areas. In contrast, the jungle temple is now more dangerous, as players can no longer see nor cut the trap wires in the temple until after the golem has been defeated. And finally, along the lines of quality of life changes, dead NPCs will now respawn freely, ignoring whatever conditions may have been required to cause them to spawn in the first place. So guys like the arms dealer or demolitionist will respawn without you having any required items in your inventory. Moving on to changes that directly impact gameplay out in the world, the biggest change, and one that makes several parts of my prior guide videos obsolete, is that the smashing of evil altars no longer has any chance to convert random blocks into their evil or hollow variants, meaning that random patches of evil or hollow biomes will no longer pop up and start to spread in random areas of the world. Additionally, there are now crimson and corruption variants of jungle grass, making it so the evil biomes can now infect and spread through the jungle without destroying it, as mud will no longer change into dirt. I'm personally a little on the fence as to whether I like the evil altar change, but without a doubt this will greatly ease many players' concerns about biome spread in hard mode. You'll still want to contain your initial evil biome areas and keep a close eye on the hard mode V, but remotely located pylon villages will now be significantly safer from hard mode biome spread. Several changes will make builders and early game explorers pretty happy. Ropes can now intersect with platforms and minecart tracks, and banners can now be hung from any platform including stairs. You used to have to hammer the platforms to the lower position to attach any banners, but not anymore. For those of you like me who strongly prefer having biome appropriate torches and campfires placed, Torches can now be block swapped directly. Do note though that in order for this to work, you need to have the torch actively equipped, as holding your auto tool select button won't work. Biome specific campfires can also now be placed once you have the torch god's favor by placing a regular campfire. Shifting to buffs, the number of active buffs you can have before they or debuffs will start to override them has been doubled from 22 up to 44. Combined with being able to use buff items from your void bag, you'll now be free to use all the buffs your heart desires without them getting replaced. As a counterpoint though, the number of active debuffs has also been increased from 5 to 20. Additionally, the class buff stations, namely the sharpening station, crystal ball, ammo box, and bewitching table now grant buffs that have no duration and will last until you die, cancel them, or leave the game. Instead of being a rare item sold by the traveling merchant, the ammo box is now sold by the arms dealer only in hard mode, and the war table, which drops from dark mages and the old one's army event, now grants a plus one summon sentry buff. The star in a bottle restores five mana per second now instead of just one, and also now reduces the cooldown before mana starts regenerating a little bit, so very nice for mages. And the duration of crate potions has been increased from 3 minutes to 4, which will make it line up much nicer with the fishing and sonar potions 8 minute durations. Crate potions have also been buffed to grant an overall 25% increased chance to catch a crate, but crates themselves have been tweaked. The wooden crate's drop chance for items commonly found in wooden chests has been increased from 1 in 40 to 1 in 20, 
which will make fighting items like the radar, aglet, and climbing claws much easier from crates if you never found any in surface level chests. Crates will also drop less ore now though, but since you don't have to worry about biome spread from smashing evil altars, players that used to fish for ore in early hard mode will now be able to smash altars without anything to worry about. Getting back to wooden chests, several primary items they have a chance to drop, including boomerangs, the wand of sparking, and the radar, can now be purchased from the skeleton merchant, whose inventory will vary based on the stage of the moon. The skeleton merchant also now sells the artisan loaf consumable item for 10 gold during a waning crescent, new moon, or waxing crescent, which permanently increases the range that a player can utilize crafting stations by four tiles in all directions. No more standing in just the right spot to use my crafting setup. Speaking of merchants, the traveling merchant has had his inventory adjusted. He now has a permanent painting slot and an extra inventory slot in hard mode that will always have an item from the more rare item pools. These changes essentially make it more likely to get his previously harder to get items, and the rarity of several items has been changed, making some more common, namely the gray and orange zapinators, and others less common, namely pad thai and pho. As noted earlier, the ammo box has been removed from his wares, as has been the Celestial Magnet, which can now be found as a primary item in Skyware chests and Sky crates from floating lakes. Magic mirrors can now be crafted using 10 glass, 3 diamonds, and 8 gold or platinum bars, and the cell phone can now be upgraded to the shell phone, adding the functionality of the magic conch and demon conch that are used to make it. The Architect Gizmo Pack can now also be upgraded into the Hand of Creation by combining it with the Ancient Chisel, Treasure Magnet, and Step Stool. There's also a new builder item, the Rubble Maker, which is sold by the Goblin Tinkerer in hard mode and allows the player to place decorative background objects and is sure to delight all builders in Terraria. Next up are some new town pets, the Town Slimes! There are eight of these guys which function the same as the town cat, dog, and bunny in that they increase the number of NPCs in a town for enabling pylons and decreasing monster spawn rates, but don't impact NPC happiness in any way. Each town slime has its own condition for enabling it to spawn, but I don't want to spoil anything for anyone that wants to figure them out on their own. If you want to know though, you can find the information on the town pets page of the wiki. Moving on to weapon and class rebalancing, all four classes got a lot of tweaking, but none got more than the melee class. In addition to the benefit of having auto swing for all your weapons, all flails got a knockback and hits per second boost when spinning around the player. Several spears, including the rotted fork, the trident, and the dark lance, now have new effects, and previously stacked boomerang weapons, namely the banana ring and light disc, are now a single item which allows them to get weapon modifiers. But the broadest and biggest benefits come to the broad sword category of weapons that basically includes all melee weapons that are swung overhead, including swords, axes, pickaxes, and hammers. Across the board, almost all of these weapons have had their combat stats increased, such as damage, attack speed, size, and or knockback. Several swords have also been given new visual effects to help differentiate them from other similar weapons. For example, the Light's Bane now has diagonal slashes of darkness that deal additional damage, while the Blood Butcherer has a stacking damage over time debuff it adds each time it hits an enemy. The Fiery Greatsword is now the Volcano and explodimates every time it hits something, and weapons like the Knight's Edge, Excalibur, true versions of these weapons, and the Terrorblade now have a really cool circular attack that goes around the player. These are just a few of the many changes to the melee class and its weapons, but the moral of the story is this. If you've ever thought about doing a pure melee playthrough, now is definitely the time to do it. Ranger weapons also generally saw DPS improvements pretty much across the board, and even the Star Cannon got some knockback added, making it able to get the top tier Unreal modifier, which it previously couldn't have. Unlike melee though, I'm not aware of any ranged weapons that got any new effects. Mages similarly didn't get any particular new effects added to weapons, but lots of mana costs and DPS numbers were adjusted. Additionally, base mana regeneration has been more than doubled, while the bonus for standing still has been reduced, with an overall net effect of letting mages stay on the move and get mana back much faster. 
And for endgame mages, the last prism now has a token amount of knockback, allowing it to get the top tier mythical modifier. As for summoners, well, they got more of a mixed bag of changes, and pre-hard mode summoners got nerfed pretty hard. The Snapthorn Whip got nominal damage and knockback increases, but its whip speed buff got reduced from 20% down to 12, and the Obsidian Armor's whip range bonus got reduced from 50% increased range down to 30% increased range, and the whip speed bonus chopped from 35% down to 15%. This set will still get the job done, and let's be honest, it was a bit overpowered before and probably deserved the nerf. Early game summoners will have a little bit of an easier time getting started though, as the spawn rate of Flinxes has effectively been increased, and the chance to get Flinx Fur has been increased by 50% overall on classic difficulty, and doubled in expert and master mode. As for the rest of the summoner toolkit, both whips, summons, and sentries were adjusted in various ways that should result in a little bit more net damage. Much of this is due to changes to monster immunity frames, which affects all classes, and essentially reduces or eliminates situations where damage from one source, such as a minion or projectile hitting a target, would temporarily prevent an enemy from taking damage from another source of damage, such as the player directly dealing damage to the target at the same time. So yeah, overall lots of great changes to the classes, and combined with the ability to instantly switch gear loadouts on the fly, players will be able to more easily enjoy the wide variety of playstyles Terraria has to offer, and Melee especially will feel a whole lot better throughout the game. Let's shift gears now and talk about other item changes I found particularly noteworthy. The Angler Armor Set now has a bonus that reduces enemy spawn rates, so you'll be better able to fish in peace. The Lucky Horseshoe accessory has been removed from Gold Chess and put back in Skyware Chess, and the Fledgling Wings have been removed from being primary loot of the Skyware Chests. They'll instead be much harder to get now, with only a 2.5% chance to be in Skyware Chess and Sky and Azure Crates. The Leaf Wings, which used to be sold by the Witch Doctor as soon as you entered Hard Mode, are now only sold after Plantera has been defeated, though their stats have been buffed to match other wings available at that stage of the game. So if you want wings in early hard mode, your best bets are Angel Wings or Demon Wings, crafted using Feathers, Souls of Light or Night respectively and Souls of Flight, or Fairy Wings made from Pixie Dust and Souls of Flight. Even better options, if you've managed to get the rare Giant Harpy Feather, are the Harpy Wings, and if you've had a snowstorm and gotten the Ice Feather from Ice Golems, you can make the Frozen Wings. Drop rates for all sorts of items have been improved, and the Bottomless Water Bucket is now a guaranteed reward from the Angler on completing your 25th fishing quest. The Enchanted Sundial, which is obtained from Hard Mode Crates, is now instantly usable whenever a natural Blood Moon or Solar Eclipse begins, so players will no longer have to suffer through the RNG of these events sometimes occurring back to back. The Tavern Keep now gives 10 Defender Medals when you first talk to him, and the costs of Tier 2 and 3 Armor Pieces and Sentry Weapons have all been reduced. Banners from killing mobs in the Old Ones Army event now give a buff for fighting their related monsters, though it's not as strong as regular banner buffs. Truffle Worms and Prismatic Lace Wings, needed for spawning Duke Fishron and the Empress of Light respectively, now have their spawn rates affected by luck, which will make farming them a bit easier. And the Celestial Sigil, used to spawn the Moon Lord manually, now costs only 12 of each Lunar Fragment rather than 20, and will spawn the boss 12 seconds after using it rather than waiting a full minute. Now let's talk about some mob and boss rebalancing, which includes some changes that I'm really a fan of. The protection radius around the player has been increased to prevent teleporting mobs from landing on top of you or quite so close, which will make unpreventable collisions far less likely. Nebula floaters also now have a half second delay after teleporting, during which they can't snipe you before you even realize where they are. Those two changes will make fighting the Nebula Pillar far less punishing, and they've also reduced the spawn of the Brain Sucklers, though the number of active predictors has been increased from 2 to 3. Solar Pillars also got toned down a bit, as Crawl Tapedes have had their damage reduced, and Korites, the biggest danger to players using the terrain to their advantage, now spawn less, charge slower, no longer charge from off-screen, and have a brief wind-up animation before charging. 
Vortex pillar tweaks include decreasing Alien Queen projectile speed, but increasing their movement speed, and Vortex portals now make a more distinct sound when spawning. The cap that previously prevented too many queens from spawning also now applies to the larva. Storm drivers will be better sharpshooters, but there is a visual effect before they fire that gives warning of the incoming shot. As for the Stardust Pillar, Stargazers similarly have a charge up effect before shooting, while large Stardust cells will be more resistant to knockback, and Weavers will move faster. One nice change that applies to all pillars is that after the Moon Lord has been defeated, you only need to kill 50 enemies to drop the pillar's shields, and the kills required to drop the shields on Expert and Master Mode difficulties is now the same as Classic. The Moon Lord himself got the damage and hitbox size of Phantasmal Spheres reduced, making them less dangerous, and the final boss will now drop two non-identical weapons every time he's defeated. Lots of other bosses got tweaked in various ways as well. Golem and Duke Fishron got their health increased, and Golem's fist punches can no longer be deflected back, but instead have a visual charge-up effect a half second before firing. Plantera's despawn mechanics have been adjusted to make it far less likely to accidentally despawn her, such as when you move away right after breaking the bulb, and pretty much all bosses have been adjusted to take up more enemy slots, which will reduce or outright eliminate other enemies spawning during the fights. There are several other smaller changes to various bosses and mobs, but let me know down in the comments if you think any specific enemies are particularly easier or harder than they were before the update. And last but certainly not least of the topics I want to mention in this video is the new Aether mini biome and the new feature it brings to Terraria, the Shimmer. The Aether biome will only be present in worlds created after the Labor of Love update was released and spawns in the outer fifth of the world on the same side as the jungle. You'll know you found it when the solid blocks and areas of darkness around you vanish and appear as if you are in space. This will happen once you're about a half screen away from the pool of Shimmer. The Shimmer itself is a strange liquid with mysterious properties and has already been covered quite extensively by other content creators. I don't want to give away very many spoilers in this video about what all you can do with the Shimmer, but suffice to say, what goes into the Shimmer is not necessarily what will come out of the Shimmer. Some consumable items will return as a new consumable that can provide various permanent buffs, while other items might change into a visually alternate version of the same item type. Some generally hard to get accessories can be obtained by throwing in different accessories into the Shimmer, and some items, once submerged, will deconstruct into their material component parts, or even upgrade into new more powerful items. Coins tossed into the Shimmer will give you luck, the more valuable the coin, the greater and longer lasting the benefit, and NPCs, critters, and certain mobs will also transform. For a list of everything you can do with this new liquid, check out its page on the wiki and or videos put out by other content creators. But that's all for me on this update at this point. The Labor of Love was a huge and amazing addition to Terraria, and makes it that I'll have to go back through my previous Terraria guide videos and add pinned comments regarding any significant changes. And of course, I will incorporate these changes into all future videos in my Beginner's Guide series. Thanks for watching, please hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!